Good day, everyone. This is Jerry Green from Los Angeles. I work at the Pacific Council on International Policy, and I am very pleased to bring our session to you today about, um, about Iran. Um, I, we really have two genuine seasoned experts on Iran um, and the Middle East in general, and I'm delighted to introduce both of them. I must um, warn you that that uh, um, every time there's an international crisis, there's a factory someplace that produces instant experts. And so the number of people who um, I hear who have never been to Iran, who don't speak to per who don't speak Persian, who you know nothing about it, are suddenly holding forth is is uh, is 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 really annoying. It's not helpful. Um, we can all read the New York Times on our own. So I, it's it's I'm really pleased to have two people. The three of us have all spent considerable amounts of time in Iran over the years. Um, let me begin by introducing Banav Kinush, who is a member of the Pacific Council, lives in Northern California, um, a, 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 um, a celebrated scholar of, of Iran. Um, she has been involved in track two diplomacy. She has worked at the World Bank. She's worked at the Asia Foundation, which actually is headquartered in San Francisco. She speaks publicly on Iranian and Middle Eastern affairs. Very unusually, she was a fellow at the King Faisal Center for Islamic Studies and Research in Saudi Arabia, another country people love to talk about despite never having been there or going to Davos in the desert for 15 minutes, which is another, another conversation. Um, she has a book, Saudi Arabia and Iran, Friends or Foes, which is a product of her, her research in, 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 in the kingdom. And most recently, and she published a book called The World Powers and Iran Before, During, and After the Nuclear Deal. And it's very prescient because she comments on bilateral relations between Iran and a number of key countries, one of which is Russia, uh, which because of, of Ukraine and other things has become enormously uh, important. She has her PhD, it says Tufts, but I'm assuming from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts, but that's just a, a guess. And um, and I'm delighted to, to welcome uh, Dr. Kinoush. Antonella Caruso is, again, a longtime member of the Pacific Council. She's a re uh, executive director of the Vittorio Dan Segre Foundation in Lugano, Switzerland. Um, she's the former director of the Middle East and West Asia Division in the Department of Political Affairs at the United Nations in New York. And in this role, oversaw um, much of the political an analysis and interactions in the Middle East, um, the Arab world, Iran, and elsewhere. Um, before she joined the UN, she, she was working on track two uh, uh, diplomacy initiatives with Iraq. Um, she's collaborated, collaborated with the Institut Montagne in France, um, which um, is, is, is the leading independent think tank in France. Um, she has um, um, been an advisor to the CEO of ENI, the Italian oil company, a place where the Middle East is important and well understood, to the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, and speaks really, really good Arabic. We were in the Middle East together, and I knew but didn't fully know until I heard her. She studied, she's this is not in your bio, but she spent two years, I think, at Ain Shams University in Egypt, for uh, which for us mistrologists is a, a very big deal. And she's published work on medieval and contemporary Islam. Finally, and before we begin, I just want to commend to all of you a book that I have not read, but I just read a review of in The Economist um, yesterday called White Torture by Nargis Muhammadi. And it's the, it's, it's the story of Iranian women um, and their, their incarceration in Iran, which obviously has direct um, applications for what we are witnessing now. The review was one, it makes it one of these books you really don't want to read, but you can't not read. It really is, is, is uh, based on the review, really disturbing, but, but important. Um, let us start with uh, Dr. Kinoush. Um, this feels kind of like 78, 79, but it feels really, really different from 78, 79. What are the similarities? What are the differences? What's going on and where will this go? And, and please just take you know five, six minutes to share your thoughts with us. And then we'll turn to Antonella Caruso and she will have five, six minutes. I'll then ask some questions and uh, audience, uh, we will open it up to your, to your questions halfway through. So welcome to you both and over to you, Dr. Kinoush. 
Thank you, Dr. Green. I think this is a great question to start with. What we had in 1979 was a clear revolution. And um, basically, uh, as often might be the case, uh, I'm not an expert on all revolutions, but oftentimes it happens when there are deep schisms in society that uh, a dialogue between the state and civil society is unable to address. And back then, uh, the components, the key components of Iran's civil society were unable to establish a dialogue with the government. And what were those three key components of civil society? Uh, one was obviously the media, which was heavily censored at the time. The second one are, are not surprisingly or surprisingly, maybe to some of our audiences, the clerical establishment in Iran which has been an important and integral part of Iranian civil society, whether people want to accept that or not, it has been the case for at the very least the last 400 years. Um, and the third component was uh, the absence of genuine independent political parties capable of negotiating with the state. As a result of the absence of the strong civil society state dialogue back then, uh, we had a breakdown of a system, a breakdown of a regime, a breakdown of the Pahlavi monarchy, which led to the Islamic revolution. Now, some 40 plus years later, there's still a conspicuous absence of a civil society dialogue with the state. Um, the clerical establishment, aside from the clerics who are part and parcel of the state and the implementation of state um, policies, there's a significant a uh, number of clerics and clerical institutions that are heavily marginalized and have been heavily marginalized since the beginning of the revolution and have in recent days and months and in the last 11 weeks since the latest protests in Iran began, told, uh, started told to, to remain quiet more or less. The media is censored and what comes out of Iran's media is heavily state-centric. And there is a conspicuous absence of a dialogue among political factions or political parties inside Iran with the state as to what is happening and where the country is headed. Neither the old establishment political elite that constituted the reformists or the conservatives are now able to really speak up and say much as to what their opinions are about what is happening. And what is very different today than what we had back in 1979, if that is that women for the first time have become agents of change. And why is that the case? The case, uh, be, that is the case because while Iran is not new to protests, some might be interested to know there are and have been on average 17 protests a day in Iran in the past five, six years, but oftentimes led by unions, by teachers, et cetera, um, that, that are smaller in number, in numbers. Women, after all, constitute more than half of Iran's society. And because they have emerged as an agent of change, the, this latest round of protests shows no signs of subsiding. Um, and it might have been the case where state security could have silenced or marginalized or quieted the other 17 protests that were happening in Iran on a daily basis in the past five years or so, but it is impossible to silence more than half of, the, of society. And while the women on the streets are not entirely all the women in Iran, they are significant in number, and some of them are emerging as organized bodies in the form of students, university students, classroom students, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And unsurprisingly, they have merged their voices with other protesters, including the unions, including ethnic minorities, religious minorities in Iran. Now, um, unfortunately, the, what is happening today is not yet a revolution as much as everybody wants to call it a revolution. It's not yet even a movement because by definition, politically, these have different, we, we, they don't really fit in. What's happening inside Iran doesn't fit in to the full definition of a revolution or a movement yet, although it does have a potential to move in either of those directions. But let's say for argument's sake that it, it is the beginning of a counter-revolutionary 
kind of uh, fiesta of sorts, led by women as agents of change, uh, which is unique, of course, in the Middle East, as my next speaker can probably might agree with me, uh, and, a tra and a trailblazer in that respect. But again, because of the conspicuous absence of a civil society state dialogue, uh, we're not sure what the, where this latest movement with this latest protest will lead to. In my humble view, the outcome of it will be determined on how fast this, this, these protests move forward versus how fast the state or the government can move forward in creating a counter narrative to what is happening. For the time being, the protesters are moving faster. And the reason for that is that A, they're led by women, B, they, the women have been able to join their voices, as I said, with other protesters, mm -hmm. other ethnic and religious minority groups, and see there's a strong international support for these latest protests um, that show very little sign of subsiding, although they have significantly been contained. Now, um, within this framework, what I want to add is that there's still, again, as I said, a conspicuous absence of a strong civil society dialogue. Therefore, we don't know what the dynamics of the protests will be like as they move forward. Secondly, um, in as far as the, the merging of voices between women and other protesters in oh. Iran is concerned, we really are not sure where that will lead because there's been a significant number of protests among Iran's ethnic and religious minorities as well. And for the time being, they're all expressing solidarity for a unified Iran, but we really don't know that if Iran becomes weaker, whether there will be splinter groups calling for, for uh, a non-unified Iran. Uh, because there are uh, ethnic minorities, religious minorities in Iran who have for long sought autonomy and that has been denied to them. And thirdly, the narratives uh, that have emerged abroad in support of uh, the women's uh, protesters and movement inside Iran is not necessarily similar to the narratives that are happening inside Iran in the sense that what the, what, what the people outside Iran are seeking May, may or may not be representative of what all people inside Iran want. The ma vast majority of people inside Iran may want change, but not many of them are agents of change yet. For those who are on the streets, they're moving a lot faster than the dialogue that is happening outside Iran in terms of, well, let's find a leader possibly from abroad that might lead these people inside Iran. The people of, in, inside Iran, those who are protesting, are going much faster than anyone is able to catch up with them. Now, whether a leader emerges inside or abroad is a different question, but I think that, that those people outside Iran who are attempting to show support for the protesters in Iran are, are failing to understand that what the people of Iran are seeking may not be exactly what they're seeking. So I'll just leave it at that. And that was just a preliminary discussion. And I hope I made sense. You made perfect sense, and thank you. I I just attended two pro-Iran demonstrations. I just happened to be walking one in Copenhagen, um, which had a, a a sort of Pahlavi feel to it, which I found peculiar, and then one in Halifax, in which um, there were a lot of Ukrainian flags, you know, largely trying to 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 to, to sort of link the two. Um, Ukraine was invaded by Russia. Um, you know, in Iran, it's a very different situation. And so it's a, it's an interesting, I couldn't figure it out. You just explained it to me, which is interesting, of which I thank you. Uh, Antonella, over to you, please. Thank you. Yes. Uh, th thanks, uh, Jerry. Thanks the Pacific Council for this very timely initiative and for inviting me. But also thanks, Banafshe, for your very deep, uh, thoughtful analysis on uh, what is going on in Iran these days. Uh, allow me to reiterate some of the points you already made, Banafshe, by also indicating what it is new uh, in this new in this wave of protest 
occurring nowadays in Iran uh, in comparison with the ones that have occurred, and there were many, during these last uh, two decades. So you already mentioned that there are, you know, 17 protests. I mean, really, in a, in a way, you know, on a daily basis, you know, we have seen protests, not just in Iran, but in the Arab world in general for many, many, many years now. But what really characterized this uh, new wave of protests is first, the fact that, uh, as you said, Banashe has uh, stemmed, you know, from the death of a young Kurdish woman. So people took the street on behalf of uh, women and minorities' rights. And this is really very unique, indeed, not just in the region, but in general, in the world. Um, the slogan of this demonstration is Kurdish. And uh, it was used, you know, in the late 20th centuries by female Kurdish uh, freedom movement uh, adherents in uh, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Turkey. It was more recently used, you know, by the female fighters against the ISIS in northeastern Syria. And these fighters, you know, continue to fight against, you know, radical Islamist movements, you know, in Syria, as well as against Turkish backed you know, uh, armed opposition groups there. In the Iranian context, it seems to me that uh, the uh, slogan means uh, equality for women, both in front of the law, but also in the labor market and uh, in politics, it means also protection from uh, the violence and the brutality of security apparatuses but also means choice, you know, freedom to choose whether or not to veil or to unveil. And in Iran, the issue of the veil has been dictated always in a kind of top-down, you know, process. In 1936, it was the Shah of Iran who imposed, banned the veil. In 83, 1983, it was Khomeini, the founder of the Islamic Republic, who instead imposed the black chador on women. So this is something obviously that for the first time women have demonstrated in order to take full agency over their own bodies. And it's backed, these, these protests are backed by different strata of society. So all classes, all age groups, all sectors, in particular academia, uh, education, industry, trade, culture, sports, arts. But also these demonstrations have quickly spread across the country and encompassing regions and ethnicities, as you already said, Banafshe. And by doing so, in a way, counterattacking the uh, regime's propaganda that they stem from Kurdish separatist groups, uh, both in Iran and in Iraq. And we will be back uh, probably to this uh, Kurdish dimension of the demonstrations and uh, the Iranian propaganda, uh, you know, uh, possibly anytime soon. But also these demonstrations have sparked demonstrations in support in uh, several capitals in uh, Europe and the US, but none in the region. And last but not least, the fact that the women have been uh, uh, lifting and burning the headscarves, I mean, obviously have seemed to have shaken one of the pillar of this, uh, uh, of this uh, system, of this system of power, which is, you know, the veil. The veil, the ideologically, not just in Iran, but many other Islamist movements have represented the resistance to the uh, US uh, imperialist culture, uh, its value system and its worldview. But the women in Iran seems to me they are demonstrating much beyond this level. They demonstrated not only for change, they don't believe in change through elections any longer. I think they've taken the street to demand the change of the system of power. And in particular, the Khamenei styled um, Belayat de Fagir. So the jurisprudence of uh, the, the uh, cleric. Um, it seems to me that these demonstrations sh sh surely, you know, um, indicate the disillusionment of the Iranians vis-a-vis -vis political processes, vis-a-vis -vis elections that in, instead in 1997 had seen an incredible participation you know, of people going you know, to the polls in order to elect Mohammad Khatami, uh, this reformist president in 1997, or in 2013 with the election of Rouhani, another reformist uh, president. But 
they have been pretty apath apathetic on, or apathic, I don't know how you say in English, but they haven't really gone massively to vote in 2020 and in 2021. Um, partially also mainly because of the uh, purge, massive purge of reformist and uh, moderate conservative candidates by the Guardian Council the one that vets candidates you know, for all possible institutions of uh, the Islamic Republic. And a Guardian Council that is heavily dominated by the conservative elements, if not by the office of the Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei. It seems also that these uh, demonstrations happen at the time in which this, there might be a crisis of succession at this uh, top echelon at the Islam of the uh, Iranian power structure. Khamenei is seeking old. Uh, maybe it's time to think about the successor, but uh, definitely nowadays when we look at the uh, structures of the uh, state in Iran, they're all heavily dominated by the ultra-conservatives or the principalist, which means the ones loyal to the values and the, val this, the value system of the Iranian Islamist Republic. Um, what to expect? I mean, we have seen the parliament and nearly unanimously uh, voting for the repression of these demonstrations. We have seen Ali Khamenei uh, lately uh, meeting uh, uh, with the Basij, uh, giving them the green light for continue the repression of the demonstrators. Um, what can we expect? Um, as it happened before, there could be a kind of, well, obviously continuous repression because um, maybe there won't be any kind of um, compromise on the line of uh, women and protesters' requests in general, but maybe some form of accommodation and some form of cooptation will go on. But in my modest view, I think that uh, any solution in these directions, you know, will be not sustainable because um, without freedom for women and minorities, it will be no freedom at all. So we will be seeing demonstrations continue, you know, to happen in Iran as more likely also if repressions continue. And as Banafshe said, no civil society dialogue with the state happens. I believe, as it happened in the pre-revolutionary Iran, radical movements might grow underneath. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I, I, I should mention, I was a student in Tehran um, in 1978, 79. So I was, I, and I left Tehran after Khomeini came back. So I, um, I, I sort of witnessed the, the revolution firsthand. And one of the things that I find um, so interesting is that the revolutionaries, you know, failed miserably. They saw they seized power and made themselves very powerful and rich, but they have not inspired much in the Islamic world other than making Islam look bad. You know, the Islamic Republic of Iran failed in its goal, which is to sort of, you know, mobilize and unite unite Muslims globally. So its 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 model was flawed from day one. I get the sense that, you know, <laughs> There's, there's potentially a model coming out of what's happening in Iran today. And I wonder what that might look like. Um, it's hard to make a prediction, particularly about the future, as they say. But I wonder if you'd both, you know, share with us a little bit, what does the model look like? Because what's going on in Iran really is the story of the Middle East writ large. You know, Mohammed bin Salman can, you know, have movie theaters in Saudi Arabia, but this is hardly synonymous with the empowerment of, 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 of women. And um, so I'm just curious, what does this mean for Iran? Um, you know, movements like this fail because of a lack of a model, you know, a, a, a business model. How do you, once you take power, you rule? I, I just mentioned to both of you, I was invited to a dinner with the, the young, you know, the baby Shah of Iran and Laguna Niguel. And, you know, if we have to go to the back to the Pahlavis as a future model for Iran, that's not very encouraging. So I'm curious, what next? Where should this be sustained and sustainable? Where might it lead? But Nafshia, what do you think? And then Antonella will have your view as well. I have to say that's a very deep and thoughtful question. Um, mm -hmm. um, and it's taken me by surprise because I don't see people thinking along these lines. Um, the, la the last time I was in Iran, uh, which was back in 2014, I actually traveled to the seminary cities in Iran 
and I uh, interviewed a lot of clerics. And to my own surprise, I found a lot of very enlightened clerics in Iran. Many of them are teachers, university professors. And I left, um, I left Iran feeling sad because I understood that there was a potential there of very intelligent people that could not completely rise to their full potential. Uh, because as I said in my talk, clerics themselves who are outside of the state or are on the margins of what the state does are not a, a entirely free to do as they wish. They are, they are uh, an important component of Iran's uh, civil society, historically speaking, and many of them have been marginalized as well. So if, if this number of clerics that I saw who were quite open-minded, quite enlightened, are unable to emerge as a civil society, as a strong civil society group, then unfortunately, I don't think Iran can present a new model of religion for the region. There's also the danger um, that because in this latest protest, or let's say counter-revolutionary uh, move that is happening inside Iran, so much of it is addressed uh, to, toward eliminating state di discrimination against women. And because the state is represented by the clerical establishment, that it is very possible that Iranian society will have no or very little tolerance for any clerical symbols to emerge in the future for Iran for a while at least. And then the full potential of these enlightened clerics will never see the light of day. And as Antonella also said, there might be violence even that will be perpetrated against clerics, many of whom might be innocent. I don't know, they might or may not be, but that is not good for Iranian society. That is not good for a region that is still heavily status quo as both of you know better than I am in which religion still plays a very dominant role. Um, so I'm not very hopeful that Iran can be a model. And if Iran cannot be a model, then that gives the current state more power to dictate its version of what it sees to be right for itself. Hmm. Antonella, what do you think? Well, I totally agree with Banafshe, and I would add the fact that because of what has happened, you know, with uh, Khamenei in particular, the religious institutions of Iran has definitely also bore the uh, terrible consequences of being, in a way, delegitimized to represent the kind of independent voice the religious authorities are supposed to play, not just in Iran, but everywhere in the uh, Muslim world. So um, having um, dramatically combined the uh, religious establishment with the higher echelon of the state, the risk, as Banafsha rightly said, has been to delegitimize both, not just I mean, the religious authorities, but also the state as well. So um, the parliament has no voice any longer in Iran. It used to be much more lively you know, in the previous decades and it's reduced to basically a rubber stamp I mean, of the policies you know, of the supreme leader. So there is not that kind of check and balances that the Republic you know, seemed to have started you know, to put in place I mean, at uh, in the first you know, steps I mean, of the Velayat Fagi system. And also, as Banafshe said, that there have been a lot of clerics who didn't really embrace fully you know, the vision of Ali Khamenei or the same, you know, Belayate Fagir. I remember Ali Montazeri, who was an incredible supporter of, uh, you know, the Belayate Fagir and ended up his life, you know, in confinement in Isfahan. So, uh, and he protested against, you know, in 1988, the purge of political opponents and their massacre by the authorities of the state. Which model? coming from a very long experience in Iraq, I mean, the model could be a Sistani model, you know, in which at the end of the day you have, yes, an authority, which is the moral, supreme, spiritual authorities of uh, this, uh, of the political system, who is a point of reference, the marja uh, of the system, but doesn't really intervene directly in the daily affairs of the country. By doing this, Sistani has not only protected his role, but it's also, you know, enhanced 
the functions and the role of the Najaf Seminary. So if we ever had to look at something, you know, that has been kind of successful, you know, religiously speaking, is that Najaf experience. The Sistani, in the end, you know, uh, influence the course of events in Iraq at the beginning, yes, it seems to me lately not. So. You know, it's, it's, I think I'm sort of a prisoner of my own culture because part of me thinks you can't not have some religious element to this, but the other part of me believes that every time you, in, you, you involve religion, it doesn't end well. Um, look at the cabinet that Bibi Netanyahu is assembling in Israel as we speak. You know, who's going to be the minister of defense, minister of police, and so forth. So it's so I'm really kind of profoundly conflicted. Um, on the other hand, and this is sort of the origin of my question, without an appropriate ruling model um, that, 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 that reflects the values and concerns of the people, um, there's going to be complete chaos. And that was Khomeini's you know, very good luck is 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 he got there first, and people that would never have supported Khomeini actually supported him because they hated the Shah so much more. So, I, you know, I don't think we're going to resolve this today, but um, it's something that 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 inquiring minds need to need to be thinking of. What should the U.S. Be do I'm sorry, go ahead, please. No, Jerry, um, I think, I mean, you point out very well when you mentioned chaos, because this is so what all, all political systems, all, you know, states and governments, you know, in the region, you know, have, uh, especially after the Arab Spring, have started, you know, to spread, you know, the fear of chaos, you know, if we fall, there will be chaos. And look at Imran Khan lately in Pakistan, you know, he decided, you know, to give up because otherwise the danger has been, would, would be chaos. And I think, I mean, chaos is really uh, what in the end, you know, make this, uh, um, let's say government, you know, sure that uh, there will not be, you know, a, an evolution of this uh, street protest that they will provoke what, uh, you know, this protest that provoked in Libya, in Egypt, in Syria, in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Yemen. So I think, I mean, that we have to put also this protest in Iraq in the context of a region, and in fact, there was no demonstrations at all in the region, in a context of a region heavily hurt by this uh, never finished, never developed process of street protest that, you know, they started in 2011 and ended miserably in most of the countries involved. I, if I may just add, I completely agree with what Antonella just said, and I, but I also want to add a dimension to it in that a lot of people in Iran happen to agree with you, uh, Jerry, that um, perhaps the clerics shouldn't have a role, religion shouldn't have a role in the future of Iran, because they're just tired of it. And even religious people are tired of, of the way religion has been politicized in the past 40 years. So while a chaos will emerge, it is possible in my humble view, that as you say, some leader by by half chance comes and gets there first uh, and, and becomes the next leader, which is very much possible if that chaos prevails. And that leader could be somebody from abroad, by the way, as someone you may have <laughs> just referred to or not. I, but, but And as you say, it is in a way a devolution of Iran's growth yeah. of, of developing a strong civil society because the Iranian people have paid already a very hefty price in the past 40 years trying to create something new. And to have the, the Shah's family return, and I have nothing against them. My family served under the Shah uh, and my family was persecuted as after the revolution. But, 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 you know, just from a political science perspective, it, it's a devolution in my humble view. But, but, but the thing is that because Iran is still fundamentally a very religious society, eventually this issue of religion has to fall in place. And we don't know how. We really don't know how. And we don't have a perfect example in the region for it, maybe, yet. You know, I was just at a meeting and, and I was talking to two of my colleagues and, and you know, they were comparing Morsi to Assisi in, in Egypt. And it was an incredibly frustrating conversation because sometimes you're confronted with a variety 
of, 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 of bad options. And the way you just put it, Benoche, somebody, whoever gets there first wins, it, that actually is certainly um, a, a possibility and a likelihood. This is a country of 80 million people. Persians are still a slight minority in Iran compared to, you know, other groups in Azerbaijan and, you know, Baluch and, you know, on and on and on. And it's, it's a country that I don't see it coming apart at the seams, but I also don't see it coming together. And I keep thinking that this women's role might provide some new model um, that, that, that doesn't really exist anywhere. And then I kind of wake myself up and, and realize how unlikely that is. Uh, let me ask you both, what should the US be doing? What should, you know, I thought, you know, with the, uh, the American soccer team did with the Iranian flag was, you know, absolutely adorable, but, you know, it, 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 it was sort of silly and meaningless. You know, in terms of U.S. policy, what should the U.S. be doing? And um, it's it's not an easy it's not an easy question, particularly you know given our other entanglements in the region. Right. Do you want to go first, Antonella? As you like. Please. You are Iranian American. You can do it. <laughs> well, well, You're both American, so you know. It's, uh... As as you both know, there's a nuclear dimension to the fate of Iran. And here we're talking of similar countries like North Korea, others who have traversed down the path of nuclear weaponization in which the state becomes so entrenched that it just becomes too much of a big headache for America to try to think about what to do next and fewer options left. And, and uh, um, in my view, Iran is already there. It's just that we're not saying it. We, we don't wanna say it. Um, and that has created uh, a lot of disheartening uh, sentiments in Washington toward, toward Tehran, while recognizing that it is essential to continue with the nuclear talks, also recognizing that it may have already reached a dead end, a, dead, a real dead end in terms of preventing Iran from weaponization if it, if it wanted to. So we can't ignore that dimension. And that is, I think, America's biggest uh, issue on the table with respect to Iran. Now, America also defends human rights um, uh, and in Iran and what is happening, but I don't think that America at least publicly can step in and, and do much because this is an indigenously grown uh, kind of movement in the shaping that will take on its own, own it's, it will become its own creature. Um, I think America may play a role quietly or may play a role later on when things become chaotic in terms of trying to sit down and figure out, well, who is the leader next? But um, for the time being, um, I, I don't see a major role. However, if you speak to the government in Iran, they would, they would say America is already doing a lot. America uh, and uh, you know, other foreign governments are already trying to break Iran into different pieces and into different countries. And these pro protests will be a precursor of that. But you know, I don't have access to intelligence, so I will not comment on that. Right, right. Antonella? Yeah, I, 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 I definitely agree. There is very little, you know, the um, countries, you know, states uh, outside Iran, you know, could do. Uh, but there is probably a lot of civil societies can do, continue really to keep, you know, the uh, eye on what goes on in Iran and continues, you know, to um, have as many voices possi possible, you know, coming out of a country which is now under siege in terms of closure of internet, um, closure of uh, uh, social media, uh, impossibility really to communicate, you know, not just, you know, among themselves, but also, you know, with the external world. So, if there is anything that could be done, you know, maybe help those voices, you know, to continue to communicate uh, among each other and eventually, you know, with the outside world. Um, in terms of America itself, I believe, you know, since the, there was an attempt, you know, to resume the JCPOA negotiations, this will obviously not be frozen. And, uh, and if ever there is a possibility to reopen that, uh, that dialogue, even though it's always been indirect dialogue, you know, between the Americans and the Iranians, 
experience, that could be probably, you know, the opportunity to hook, you know, the human rights dimension and not only the security one into those uh, into those uh, negotiations. And I think that would be helpful, but only when, as uh, Banafshi said, you know, the uh, demonstrations, you know, continues to produce, you know, that impactful change on the ground that will require an understanding of who does what, you know, back then in Iran. The other thing I think that's really important is the work of the National Endowment for Democracy, the National Democratic Institute, the International uh, the IRI, which is the International Republican Institute, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, um, a whole variety of, of organizations that have um, global credibility, global reach, um, they are sort of the gold standard of reporting um, on, on, on difficult situations. And I think it's, it's absolutely imperative that those organizations continue their work and continue to ramp it up. It's very much your Freedom House. I mean, there's a long list of, of notable organizations that, that this is their moment. This is the time uh, to do it. And there are large numbers of Iranians who you know will 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 hope for their success and benefit from their their work. You know, Iranians will have to find some Iranian model um, for for themselves. But global support, I think, is is a, global support being global attention to this exactly. is really really important. And and um, so that's something that I think um, is it should be should be emphasized. Uh, let me see. I think there's a question here. Oh, this is from Salama Mariati. Good morning, Salam, or good afternoon. Oh, it's still morning. Uh, um, rarely has the U.S. government helped on any social issue, whether women's rights or minority rights in the region. How can people-to-people -people diplomacy action outside human rights groups help and or hinder this important uh, movement? Um, and let me, if I may add, given um, Salam's leadership in the Islamic community in, in California, but, you know, I would add to that uh, the religious community, which, you know, the faith community, it's not simply Muslims, it's, it's others as well, universal values. So uh, it's a good question. Um, what, what suggestions do you have? The, the religious community abroad has for some time tried to establish a religious dialogue with Iran's state-led religious establishment. Um, I have been witness to that myself firsthand for a number of years. Um, while it is helpful, it has often led to the frustration on the end of the religious community outside Iran over how little attention the Iranian government actually in practice pays to attention to the religious views of others other than its own. Um, and so we are really speaking of a state that is unwilling to open up civil society significantly to have these this level of people to people dialogue, even if it's over religion. And um, back to your comment at the, um, before you raised this question about the importance of global civil society, um, it is very vital global civil society when there's a conspicuous absence of a strong civil society in Iran to at least shed light on what civil society would like to have inside Iran. But at the same time, again, when you're dealing with a closed society, not that the people of Iran are closed, but as Antonella said, the borders are closed, then it's vital for this global civil society to be able to pick on the kind of conversations that people in Iran are really trying to build. Uh, and same with faith groups outside Iran, to really better understand the people of Iran and see what kind of dialogues to pick that will help better advance their cause. So rather than being crusaders of the Iranian cause, let the Iranians be their own crusaders and, and follow and see where the backup support can happen. Otherwise, I think we will be beating ourselves up um, because we won't really be able to connect with the dynamics that will evolve inside Iran. Antonella, what do you think? Because you were involved in track two negotiations in Iraq and, and elsewhere, people to people is important. What should it look like? How can we, how can it be made to make a difference? 
Well, unfortunately, I think I mean Banafshe, you know, said it right, and I would also add that you know the terrible impact again of the uh, so-called Arab Spring. I mean, on these uh, people-to-people, you know, contacts. You know, everywhere in the region there have been restrictions of uh, this uh, people-to-people dialogue, meaning civil societies, you know, from abroad, you know, intervening, I mean, and and doing projects, you know, with other groups and empowering other groups, I mean, locally, especially if this means, you know, empowering voices of dissent. So let's also be honest that this is the point. And, um, and I believe, you know, for the time being, there is no much to do apart from keeping alive those voices inside Iran and making them communicate, you know, among themselves and eventually, you know, understanding, you know, through the, 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 through their projections outside the borders, what really eventually they would need once, you know, they will ask, you know, for something. So for the time being, as Banafshe said, it's something that the Iranians are running by themselves. And uh, maybe no interferences will be probably better at this moment. In order not to expose the same demonstrators to what is a regime's propaganda of people, you know, who tends to see the demonstrators as lackey of uh, the U.S., Israel, Saudi Arabia, and others allied of the US. I mean, the uh, latest, uh, um, the latest, you know, coming from the head of the IRGC has been really calling the demonstrators, the protesters, not only Kufar, meaning disbelievers, but also people linked with outside powers, namely Saudi Arabia, uh, US, uh, UK, and Germany. So we had to be careful also, not only to help delegitimize this protest, but also to make sure that they're not harmed by any activity outside, you know, the borders. You know, Benafshe said something earlier, which, which I, I keep thinking about. I've been thinking about it for years that after her last visit to Iran, um, she was saddened um, because she met all of these really gifted people. And, and, and for years and years and years, I have been fruitlessly advocating that the United States make the issuance of visas um, easier. I mean, it's not, it's hard for Iranians because they have to go to Dubai or Ankara. Um, you know, they have to leave the country to simply apply for a visa. But then the entire process of getting a visa is so incredibly uh, bureaucratic and complicated. Um, or universities, UCLA, USC. Um, we're living in, in a city with the largest Iranian population in the world outside of Iran. Um, the engineering school at USC, I mean, the Iranians are, you know, leaders in engineering. Why aren't scholarships being given to Iranian students? People care so much about Iran. This is a good way to show it because it's it's hearts and minds. If young Iranians come here and and and, and get educated and then they go back to Iran in, in a whole variety of fields, um, it would be very powerful. And we've never, ever done that. We've never, ever done that. And I think now more than ever, I mean, now it's going to be even more difficult yeah. because the Iranian government is going to make it virtually impossible. But, um, you know, these are people that are fighting on values which allegedly are synonymous with us as a country. Um, and there are ways uh, that, that we would be able to be more supportive of this. And to date, we've come up short. We've come up sh short. You know, suddenly Iran is the new, you know, the shiny new object. Uh, this has been going on for decades. This is simply the Iranian people saying enough, we can't take any more. It wasn't any better before. It's just now people have been, you know, pushed to, to, to the, to the uh, uh, you know, to the limit. And as a result, they, they, they have no alternative. I think we're going to begin to, 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 to end. I'd like to, you know, if there are any final words that either one of you would like our, our members to, 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 to think about as, as they go back to their, their lives. This, is, this would, be, would be very, very helpful. We will revisit this, this, this um, situation again and again and again, and because it's just, it's so important. But what final thoughts do you both have to, to share with our, our members, your fellow members? Um, Bernesha, why don't you go first and then we'll give out to Nella the last, the last, last word. 
Sure. I want to say that when I came and joined Fletcher, I came with some family money and some of my own work money to put myself through Fletcher. But had it not been for scholarships, I would not have made it. Mm -hmm. And I received the support of the Fletcher School through significant scholarship support that made me be who I am today. But as you say, it's very little and very far in between. And I hope that America and American educational institutions will show more foresight in supporting Iranian students like myself who came here um, for the first time and are now a kind of a voice that is able to bridge two cultures, two political sensibilities uh, in, 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 in a way that you know, could be very helpful. I think America can play an important role as, as a partner for a future of Iran if America is better able to place itself in the shoes of Iran and what the country has gone through in the past 42 years. Um, if we fall short of that, then America will create more hurdles in its own foreign policy for itself toward Iran and will not have Iran on its side in the foreseeable future. What does that mean for civil society groups? I think is that we need to be brighter and sharper and more nuanced in our approach in understanding movements, counter revolutions. And for the first time, a woman led a movement that I don't know in, in recent history of any part of the world which has witnessed what Iran is going through. Iran is a trailblazer and has been for a long time. As you say, its students are all over California but for some reason, this country fails to live up to its brilliance and its potential. And we're going to have to figure out where to tap into to help that country. Really well put. I, I have yeah. been saying this for decades. Uh, Antonella. Well, I will refocus on the region because uh, at the end of the day, Iran is in the Middle East and uh, it has, you know, relations with certain countries in the region. Maybe in this regard, I will look upon Iraq and the possibility that the dialogue, you know, really could start, you know, uh, seriously uh, from a country that uh, obviously has been bearing Iranian interferences heavily, but on the other side has also nourished and developed incredible links, not just you know, with the people in power, but people in general. Thanks to that religious you know, uh, kind of links you know, between Najaf and Qom, between you know, the shrine cities in, uh, in Iraq, uh, the, sh uh, the cities in uh, Iran, I think I mean, that there, there is prob probably the possibility to start that dialogue that we from here cannot really start. Uh, so I, I think, I mean, that uh, we probably should start thinking about who in the region can reach out to the Iranians. Yeah, no, absolutely right. I think on this note, I wanna thank you, you both. This, is, this issue is, is too important to be left to the amateurs and we have not. And um, so I'd like to thank you both. We will reconvene and continue to, to, to explore this issue and hopefully it will have a better outcome than, than, than um, you know, many of us fear. Thank you both. I wanna thank all of our members and Sam and Valerie, my colleagues for making this happen and we will sign off. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thanks.